For this presentation, I would like to emphasize the good news of grace. So let's get started. So with grace, what's the big deal? Well, before we can find that out, what's the definition of grace? From the Old Testament, it's pronounced as Cain, which means kindness, favor. This is derived from Kanen, which means to stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor, to bestow. So it is God stooping down to us in his kindness, bestowing his favor upon us. The New Testament definition is caris, which means gratifying, divine influence upon the heart. It's a benefit, a favor, a gift, a joy, a liberality. This is derived from cariro. It means to be cheerful, happy, aloft. It's God pouring into us and upon us his gifts because he favors us. Another way to explain grace is with the acronym, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. Grace is God's loving kindness. Grace is a gift. It cannot be earned. It cannot be deserved. So, what is the big deal with grace? So let's find out from the scriptures. In Proverbs 22, it's written, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. Hebrews, it's written, For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods that have not profited those who have been occupied with them. The uh, salutation, grace, to you is found in every letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches. And other books that have this include the first and second general letters of Peter, uh, the second letter of the Apostle John, and the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, the very last statement in the book of Revelation reads, May the Lord, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. In Psalm 63, it says, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. So what's the big deal? Grace, his strong favor towards us, is the only means by which we are made right with God. Grace is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. Here's scriptural examples of grace. Adam and Eve, after they sinned in the garden and after the fall, the Lord God made tunics of skin to clothe them. This was the first animal sacrifice. And this was a type of shadow of the sacrifice that Jesus would make and clothe them in his righteousness. With Noah's Ark, It is where in Genesis, it's with Noah that grace is first mentioned, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Also, Noah was instructed to cover the inside and outside of the ark with pitch. Pitch can also be considered as atonement. It was atonement. And another thing about the ark is that God waited another seven days before sending the flood upon the earth. Anyone willing could have entered the ark during that time and be rescued with Noah and his family. And the ark itself is a type and shadow of Jesus. All of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are in him and he is the one who saves us from the wrath that is to come. Another example of grace, let me, where Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And in that same manner, Jesus Christ died with us.
another example of grace where Elijah, after he fled from the uh, evil queen Jezebel, <clears throat> and he was worn out, he prayed to the Lord, he said, Now take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And what happened? An angel was sent to him with food, saying to him, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Another example of grace is a woman caught in adultery. <clears throat> Those who accused her wanted to condemn her, but they could not without condemning themselves. But however, with Jesus Christ, who could condemn her, would not and did not want to. Finally, a very strong example and climax of grace is while on the cross enduring the torture Jesus said Father forgive them that is those who put them there for they do not know what they do another example is with Saul of Tarsus when he was on the road to Damascus on a mission to arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> he was knocked to the ground with an earthquake and he saw the bright light and heard the voice saying, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And he said something very interesting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Here, Jesus, our risen Lord, was concerned about Paul and his own well-being, even in the middle of what Paul was doing. That is strong grace. So we'll go into the three types of grace. Start with prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is considered the here before grace. It was with us even before we were born. It is God's favor upon us before we even had a clue about who God or who Jesus really is. It comes before any decision on our part. It is the transforming power of God's love at work in our lives before we even became aware of it, of what was going on. Prevenient grace can also be called pursuing grace. It is God pursuing us with his gift, his son Jesus Christ, in his hand can also be called preventing grace. It is God preventing us from going too far to become unredeemable. Prevenient grace keeps us from dying without Jesus Christ. This is experienced by the Holy Spirit convicting and convincing us concerning who Jesus is, concerning our sin state, our sin condition, and concerning the condemnation and judgment that our sins bring upon us. It is also experienced by both positive and negative events. It's ex also experienced through the body of Christ, that is the church, in their interaction with us. It's also experienced by the care of others toward us. It is the great, again, it's the grace that is here before. It's God's love wooing us, God's will drawing us, God's desire pursuing us. A good example of grace in general, and prevenient grace in particular, can be found in Psalm 107. Starting in verse 4, it says, They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And then the Lord led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city of habitation. And then continuing on, in verse 10, Those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and in chains, because they rebelled against the words of God, and they condemned the counsel of the Most High. 
Therefore he brought them their heart down with labor. They fell down, and there was no one to help. Then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their bonds in pieces. Continuing on with verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near unto the gates of death. Then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his words, and healed them, and he delivered them from their destructions. And then, continuing on in um, verse 23, They that go down to the sea in ships, and do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep of the waters. He, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind and lifted up the waves. They, they go back and forth from the heavens and they go down again to the depths and their soul is melted because of this trouble. They rock back and forth and stagger like a drunken man and they are at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distresses. He makes the storm a calm, so that the waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet, and so the Lord brings them out to, unto their desired haven. And then finally, in the last verse, it says, Whoever is wise, they will observe these things, and they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. And as mentioned before, loving kindness is God's grace, his favor towards us that we can never deserve. So, why does God care? Well, humans are created in God's image for a relationship with Him, an eternal one. We are internally wired for God. That is, the deepest part of ourselves longs for the deepest relationship with Him. Why does God care? Caring is who God is. That's who he is. Scripture reveals that God is love, and that is agape type love. And agape is giving of yourself for someone else's benefit, even when it's to your own hurt. That's the type of person whom God is. In fact, God preferred to take the punishment of hell upon himself instead of for us to end up there stuck in there in our sins so that brings us to the next type of grace it's called justifying grace we need to preface this by justifying grace is the bad news human sin sin brings about God's righteous anger Sin causes harm. Sin results in death. We were born with sin in our human nature. The good news is God's grace that is his favor upon us is more powerful than all of our wrong choices put together. That is, the grace in God is greater than the sin in us. So justifying grace can also be Pardoning grace, all sins pardoned. Redeeming grace, purchased from the slave market of sin. Atoning grace, price for all sins paid. Justifying grace, it is obtained the moment we receive God's offer of a relationship with Him, an eternal life at no cost to us. That is, we receive God's embrace received we have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace not according to how loyal we are to God not according to how committed we are not according to how much we try or how, or how we try our best it's according to the riches of his favor toward us we have eternal life that's new life 
we are put by Jesus Christ, his Son, in right standing with God forever. We are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a mystical, spiritual body that, con that consists of every single person who has believed in Jesus Christ, God's Son, for their sins, for the salvation from their sins, that is. We are forgiven, uh, we are given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within our within our physical bodies with our spirit. And our physical bodies are therefore considered as sacred. They are considered temples of the Holy Spirit. Now the way of saying justifying grace is, Jesus makes me justified, never sinned. It's a miracle that only he could perform. So due to Jesus and his finished work, God's justice is on our side, not against us. It's on our side because now God's justice demands our acquittal from every sin for Jesus' sake. Not just ours, but for Jesus' sake because he went through a lot on the cross for us. And he even demands more than that for us. So in going to the cross, Jesus put our well-being ahead of his own. And again, Jesus put more importance on our well-being than his own, on his own. Truth is, Jesus is far more on our side than we ourselves are. So God the Father, if he had switched roles with the Son and came to the earth as a man, he would have went to the cross and died for us exactly in the same manner as Jesus did his son. And this is also true of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> call me heretical, call me a heretic, but this is true. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are of the same type of person. Justifying grace removes every requirement against us because God the Father nailed every ordinance against us to the cross. So obje objection to justifying grace. Knowing that tomorrow's sins are forgiven encourages me to sin more. This is a, an erroneous conclusion using that demonic sensual type of wisdom. But answers to, to that objection, grace superabounds against sin. Grace is not a license to sin, it is against sin. Grace condemns sin in us. It does not foster it and cause it to grow, it condemns it. Grace is the only antidote for sin. So, Let's suppose that tomorrow's sins are not forgiven. So as a so as a believer, we receive that justifying grace. But let's say we do a sin and then God just will not forgive us for it. That means any sin against us not forgiven by God means we'll be separated from Him from and from Jesus Christ forever. Do you realize how grossly unfair and unjust this would be to, to Jesus to be have Jesus treated that way after all he went through on the cross for us you see it's for Jesus sake not just ours that we want to be with him in heaven so this idea knowing that tomorrow's sins are forgiven encourages me to sin more nope the truth is Knowing that God, that tomorrow's sins are forgiven, encourage me to draw closer to Jesus so that sin is uprooted and sin <clears throat> becomes less and less a part of my life. That's the real truth of being justified. So, will you? Open your heart to God and accept the relationship that he freely offers in Jesus Christ and be justified.
Now we come to the third aspect of grace, that's sanctifying grace. This is, can also be called purifying grace. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to root out sin. You see, the term holy with Holy Spirit it does not just describe the Holy Spirit, but it also describes his function. <clears throat> and that it is the function to make us holy. Sanctifying grace seeks to go to the very place of sin where we are the weakest to superabound against that sin. Sanctifying grace can also be called perfecting grace, not in the sense of flawless, but in the sense of wholeness, of completeness, in the sense of being connected to Jesus Christ. As Jesus himself said in the Gospel of Matthew, Be ye therefore perfect, that is whole, as your Father in heaven is also perfect, that is whole, complete. Sanctifying grace can also be called separating grace. It is God at work to continuously keep us separate from the sin of the world. So as we go on and grow on in Jesus, we feel less and less at home in this life. So we would feel more and more as pilgrims and strangers in this present evil age in which we live. It can, sanctifying grace can also be called maturing grace. It is God continuously at work to grow us up spiritually. That is in our new selves in Jesus Christ. In our real and true selves in Jesus Christ. Sanctifying grace is the gift of God that provides the desire and the power and the motivation to grow in our relationship with God through Jesus his Son. Sanctifying grace makes us ripe for glory. It restores us to original righteousness, the righteousness in Jesus that God intended us, for to, us to have from the beginning imparts righteousness to us. Righteousness is not something we generate within ourselves by obeying laws or by adopting habits. It is inherited through Jesus into our spirit. It perfects us more and more. It equips us to be Jesus' hands and feet to the world, to draw others toward Jesus Christ himself. In sanctifying grace, we are involved with Jesus throughout life. That includes with prayer, with worship, in study, in ministry. And all these, in, in general, become food for our spiritual growth. Sanctifying grace, <clears throat> we need to remember that God never calls our relationship with him into question because of our behavior. But instead, he calls our behavior into question because of our relationship with him. We are his sons and daughters, and when we don't act like it, he calls that behavior into question because he says, you're not acting like one who is my son and my daughter. It's important to remember that we can never be so bad as to make Jesus to stop loving us. And we can also not be so good as to make Jesus love us either. We have no control over that. So, why not allow for the possibility of Jesus to bring us into perfection? So again, we covered the three types of grace. And it's God's grace. It's his strong favor toward us. And that's prevenient, which comes into our life before any decision on our part. It's God's salvation at work toward us before we were confronted with the truth of Jesus, his death on the cross for our sins, and the fact that we need his salvation. The justifying is in response where we believe upon him and are saved. And the sanctifying, which is growing up into our new and true selves in him. 
attributes of grace. God's favor toward us is abundant, yet unlike these ideal supply and demand, even though it's very abundant, it is extremely precious. It is unmerited. It cannot be deserved. It is lavish. It just... Um, <clears throat> it just uh, lavishes all aspects of our life spiritually. It is very rich. It is very powerful. It superabounds against sin. So where sin tries to drag us to death, grace, even more so, abounds against sin to keep us toward life. It is greater than the condemnation of others. It's greater even than our own condemnation against ourselves. If we feel that way at times, it is stronger than guilt. It is stronger than the evil that's in this world. It is stronger than the pains that we endure and the sicknesses and troubles and dangers that we endure. God's favor toward us is very beautiful, and it is effective. It does not fail to save and restore us. It is both pure and purifying. It is steadfast. It does not waver. It is very transforming. It changes us from one glory to another glory, all the way on until we reach our full glory in Jesus. It is very satisfying. The effects of God's grace toward us include we become slaves to Jesus' obedience, not to some self-righteous obedience that we claim for God, but rather it's the obedience of Jesus in us, working within us. We are transformed within. We are justified from all sins. We are forever in right standing with God. We are made pure. We are freed from every requirement against us. Effects of grace include healing in our body, in our soul, in our mind, in our spirit. It includes deliverance from temptation, from trials, and deliverance through them. It includes protection. Responses to grace, to God's grace, is joy. We receive it. We Filled with joy, joy of the Holy Spirit. Thanks. We thank. We are very thankful to Jesus for thinking so much of us to go to the cross for us. We thank God, his Father, who sent him to the cross for us. We do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. We th and we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that he gives to us. Now the response is praise. Adoration and to, and to compliment, to lift God up above all else. Worship, that is worth-ship, meaning that God is worth everything. And of course, the sad response to grace is rejection. Most common reject, rejection is, I really don't need this. I'm fine just as I am. So it is your response to the grace of Almighty God given through Jesus Christ, His Son. Now we come to obstacles to grace. And I just want to remind you, there is no obstacle that can hold back grace. God's grace superabounds. To find an obstacle to grace is anything that hinders us from enjoying our loving relationship to God in Jesus Christ. So the obvious obstacle is human sin. Basically, the Christian life takes place in this fallen world or the so-called real world where sin is all too common. Some way to define sin includes self-centeredness that's the big I in the word sin basically where it is all about me there's a lot of people that have that attitude where everything is all about them 
Another definition is to miss the mark. And in this case, it's the like the idea of an archer who misses the bullseye on a target that he was aiming for. Another definition is anything that diminishes the life that God wants for us to have. Sin itself, it's a monster, an enslaving addiction that can cause us to do things we never thought we could be capable of. But be encouraged, there is no obstacle that can hold back grace. God's strong, powerful grace superbounds against sin. Some ways that sin in our lives is manifested. Idolatry. It's replacing God with a lesser God that we think is a better alternative. It isn't just having some statue that we bow down toward, but it could be anything. It could be a ministry. It could be um, a family member. It could be a job. It could be money. Uh, it could be um, an agenda, a goal, a dream. All these are different types of idols. It could be, of course, celebrity or a cause, but anything. Blasphemy, it's speaking evil of God. Resisting God, opposing Him. Another one is just ignore Him altogether, as though He doesn't matter. And outright disobeying God. In unbelief, it's not just to um, have doubts of whether what God said is true or not, but it's actually a willful act to deliberately make God out to be the liar, where you are, where you yourself, you think you are more right than him or more true than he is. There's also the willful ignorance, pride, conceit that I am so great and wonderful attitude. It was the first sin invented that started the whole mess in, in the world and the universe to begin with. Unforgiveness, that's keeping score and to use as a mean of extortion and manipulation and with fear toward others. Of course, murder. Abuse includes verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, psychological abuse. Lying. Slander, dishonor, laziness, stealing, coveting, lusting after something that you know you shouldn't have, addiction, something that you just cannot do without. These are various ways that sin, that sin condition, manifests itself in our lives. But again, be encouraged. There is no obstacle that can hold back sin. That well, that can hold back grace. That is, grace superbounds against sin. The effects of sin include death, decay, anger, alienation. That's alienation from God, from others, even from our own selves. Include destruction, broken trust. However, again, there is no obstacle that can hold back God's grace because His grace superabounds against all these obstacles. But here's a sinister obstacle, and this is one that too many people who are prone to trust in their own efforts and in their own righteousness fall into. That is the so-called life by the law. Life by the law is a delusion that we can overcome sin by our own willpower, be made right with God by obeying His rules, stay in the right with God by obeying His rules, transform our own selves into better people. It's a lie that we think we can make our own selves deserving of God's love. The focus of life by the law is always on what we are to do in what we are not to do. And the end result of this life by the law, so-called frustration, hostility, resentment, disillusionment, 
And even if we could have this life by the law, which is not possible, it would be a serious fall from grace. It's not like this where it's just a small step downward. No, it's more like this, like a huge fall from grace, from Jesus Christ. But again, be encouraged. There is no obstacle that can hold back God's grace. His favor towards us superbounds against every obstacle. So let's contrast the law with grace. Now this is God's law. So, so let's get started. So between the law that is derived from the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> contrast that with grace, that's Jesus Christ himself, in whom he is full of grace and truth. The law <clears throat> makes no one righteous, whereas with grace, righteousness is inherited. Under the law, one is a slave to sin, but under grace, we are slaves to Jesus Christ's righteousness. The law condemns the sinner. Grace condemns the sin condition. You must always do the works of the law to live. That is, those who are under the law, who under the works of the law shall live in them. Yet Jesus gives us his life. With the law is the oldness of the letter, but under grace is the newness of the Holy Spirit. The letter kills, but the Holy Spirit gives life. Under the law is the prayer, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is, forgive us in the same manner that we forgive our debtors. However, under grace we are forgiven according to the riches of his grace toward us. So therefore we forgive because we have been forgiven. With the law, to whom much is given, much is required. But under grace, the handwriting of every requirement against us was wiped out by God through Jesus on the cross. Under the law, the law itself is called the ministry of death. But with grace, it's the ministry of eternal life. The law will fade away. Grace goes on forever into eternity. The law is not of faith, but grace emphasizes faith, and that is the faith of Jesus Christ. Under the law, there's continual animal sacrifices for sin. Under grace, there's only one sacrifice, that's Jesus Christ himself. He's the one sacrifice once and for all. There is no law that can give life, but under grace gives life eternal. The law arouses sinful passions, and that is the sin in human nature responding against the law. However, grace produces godliness within us. The law brings wrath, God's righteous wrath, and also wrath of humans against not being able to have what they want. But grace brings reconciliation between God and people. The focus of the law is on you. It's you don't do this, you don't do that. But under grace, the focus is on Jesus Christ, that he cares for you. The law condemns the very best of us, but under grace justifies the worst of us, and then in time transforms the worst of us into being better than the best. Under the law, 3,000 died of the uh, Hebrews died at Mount Sinai, but under grace there were 3,000 saved at the day of Pentecost. The law centered around, do this, don't do that, but grace is centered around Jesus, that he loves us. The law causes sin to be manifested, causes sin to be shown in a, through a person in a person's life. But grace causes godliness, causes Jesus in his life to be manifested through our lives. Under law, one is fallen from grace. 
but in grace we are made to stand even in the day of judgment grace makes us to stand under the law rejects those who reject God but under grace we are reconciled all of us who once rejected God the law is the strength of sin but grace is the strength of godliness the, the law is holy and grace is holy the law is spiritual as well as grace is spiritual. However, God never intended for us to be made right with him through any law. The law is designed to bring out sin in us. The just condemnation of the law and the fear of death is the whip to drive us to Jesus Christ, who is our salvation. So where is your main focus? Is it upon what you do and don't do? Or is it upon Jesus Christ that he favors you and leads you in your walk with him? This brings us to our another aspect of grace, that is the means of grace. Grace is not an object of study. Grace, God's favor, is experienced. So means of grace, they are sacred moments and they include sacraments where Jesus Christ himself is represented, or to better, put it better, where Jesus is represented toward us anew. It's the same Jesus presented in a new way. Means of grace gives access to God's presence in the world. We cannot control the means by which God shows his grace or by which he extends his grace toward us. However, we can ask God to keep our eyes open to see His grace, His favor, at work in our lives. We desperately need heaven on earth. That is, we need our Jesus Christ in heaven to invade our personal lives here on earth, mainly through His Holy Spirit. Specific means of grace include Holy Communion, that's taking in Jesus, Baptism, being identified with Jesus, ordination, its transition to a specific ministry, miracles, which are like God's love in your face, prayer, even silence in the presence of Jesus is prayer, ministry, that's Jesus' work where he involves us, includes Bible reading and study, it's what the Holy Spirit brings out and brings our attention to. Confession, that's agreeing with God concerning a sin, so that we let it go. Worship, that is worth-ship, that's directing God as being worth everything. Fasting, it's not just from food, but from also from other things of the world, like TV, uh, music, um, basic um just life in the world. It is um, fasting from worldly things to feast upon heavenly things. Other means of Christ include art, beauty, music, special places, special events, special memories, special people, literature, movies, and documentaries. It's through all of these by which Jesus Christ is represented to us and we were reminded of him so what by specific means has Jesus shown his grace to you and by what specific me means has Jesus Christ been revealed to you more and more and here's some examples like scenery here <clears throat> sunlight near a pool of water you know, a small waterfall in a secluded place like this, very private. And here you see the light really contrasted with the darkness. Here's another means of grace where you see the reflection. So it is Jesus being reflected through his Holy Spirit toward us. There's another one, grace-like rain pouring down upon us. Another one, beauty, 
and again, a reflection, reflection <clears throat> of Jesus through his Holy Spirit toward us. Here's another one. And another. <clears throat> Here in this secluded place, um, between these cliffs and the valley, here you see, and here, th like this uh, garden here, in this secluded valley, on on the way of travel, is some means of grace. Here's another one, kind of interesting clouds looking like hand opening up the sky, by which God's grace sh um, sh comes through. Upon us. Here's one. Jesus, our co pilot, guiding us through the stormy times in our lives. And finally, we come to grace. Lumped up, it's God's strong favor in his agape love towards us.